Good morning team. It is 4.40 here in Canary and I'm just making some tea. And I'm cognizant that the uh, audio isn't the best on this phone. So while the tea is being made, I'll leave you guys alone and we will catch up in a second. Alrighty guys, so it is Wednesday. Wednesday the 31st of July. So almost into August and this video is primarily going to be me taking you through more or less a week of my training. Like it's not a full week, but it kind of gives you some insights into different aspects of the training that I do, which I think will give you guys a better appreciation um, for you know what I really get up to throughout the week because I don't tend to share all that much um, on Instagram in terms of like you know laying out my week. So um, I think YouTube is a better place to do that. And what I will do is once I'm back from Belarus in a few weeks, because um, I'm going away in like 10 days, or is it? Is it a week? No, it's not a week. I was like, shit, is it a week? Um, yeah, it's about 10 days time I'm going to Belarus, which means that my program will be disrupted. So when I come back from there, I'll essentially lay out my proper programming plans then because I am going to be switching um, Jiu Jitsu clubs to Cork, which means different times, different availabilities um, and stuff like that. I also have to find out if I'm going to be in college or not. And so all those things will impact the programming decisions that I make. So to get to the point of what I wanted to discuss for this morning, um, one of the things I said at the start of this video was that I was making tea. And if you've been following me for any length of time, generally not a big tea guy, I'm a coffee guy. I like coffee a lot. I've probably been drinking it for six years straight with very little break, you know, relatively consistently. Um, no more than a couple of days of a break if there has been even that, that long that I've gone without coffee or some sort of caffeinated beverage. So I do generally have quite a high caffeine intake. And recently, you know, I've been, I, I, I like to measure a couple of things or at least keep on top of things that I might, I think might be weak points in my health. And for me personally, because I have a history of poor sleep, not anymore, um, quite high stress, not currently, um, and also, you know, drinking a lot of caffeine, I'd be concerned about, you know, my blood pressure. So that's something I check quite regularly just to make sure that my blood pressure is in a good place. So, so yeah, that's just something that I'm, that I'm concerned with and want to make sure that I manage because, you know, high blood pressure is a serious risk factor for stroke and is generally a negative prognostic factor for your long-term outcomes in terms of health. So, you know, if you, if you have high blood pressure when you're young, it's probably going to, you know, maintain or get worse as you get older and potentially lead to, you know, adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So, not ideal. Hypertension is a problem. If your blood pressure is high, not good. If you are, if you've never checked your blood pressure and you've no idea what it is, it's at least worth, you know, checking that at some point in time so you know where it is, especially if you have a couple of risk factors. Like for example, if you don't exercise, if you eat a fairly poor quality diet, you know, you don't eat many vegetables or anything like that, and you're eating mainly processed kind of quote unquote junk foods, you're overweight, um, you don't sleep much, you smoke, etc. You know, so you've got, if you've got multiple risk factors, that's something that's worth considering. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, like, my blood pressure has like it's it's never been it's never ran consistently as low as I th think it should for someone with my general lifestyle and health behaviors. So you know if you were if someone was to describe me and the way I live my life to me, I'd be like, oh yeah, that person probably has like perfect blood pressure, probably like one fifteen over seventy five, like no problems. But for me, it's kind of run a little bit higher. Um, so in terms of like addressing that and getting getting to the the, the kind of the kind of thing that I feel I could change to, you know, get my blood pressure back into a good place. Coffee seemed to be like the potential, you know, red flag that I was like, you know what, I actually am drinking a lot of coffee. I'm consistently drinking caffeine over time. Um, there are a subset of individuals, like it's, it's not a consistent finding. So this isn't fear mongering about caffeine. Coffee, like coffee is generally, um, would be shown to have like potentially net benefits to health over time. So, and certainly not like net negatives, but there are, you know, outliers to those kind of average mean statistics in the population. So it's always worth considering that when you're considering anything that relates to health or advice that you're giving that there, there are people on either side of the mean, and we need to consider that. 
So yeah, trying to essentially assess if like remove or reducing my caffeine intake down to very low, you know, there is there is obviously caffeine in tea, but not a whole pile, especially the teas that I'm drinking. Um, essentially seeing if that has an effect on my blood pressure, obviously a positive effect, a lowering effect. And so far it has, and so far my blood pressure has actually reduced like pretty quickly. Um, since I started, since I started like just taking my caffeine intake down very low, and obviously like that makes a lot of sense. Um, in that like if 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 I was one of those people who happens to be a little bit more sensitive to hypertension or high blood pressure in response to caffeine, then you might expect to see that effect that, that you you know you you remove the agent, the caffeine in this case, and that you might see that positive outcome. Um, pretty soon after because caffeine essentially can have like vasoconstrictive effects and that like it essentially it's the opposite of like what we want when we're going to the gym and getting a pump for example you know if you if you're going to the gym and getting a pump you want your blood vessels to be as dilated as possible not constricted whereas caffeine kind of has that constrictive um, effect or at least it can um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you, you shouldn't have caffeine before the gym because i think it's a it's a net benefit for sure um, and any any potential basic constrictive effects are, are outweighed um, especially if you're using like a, a pre-workout product that has other things in it uh, but anyway we, we need to worry about that for the moment that's not the topic of this discussion but yeah, basically there are a couple, there are, there have been some like identified like single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms like SNPs. Um, essentially we can just say like your genetics. Essentially there are a couple of those that have been, you know, associated with that kind of link between caffeine and hypertension. So some individuals might be a little bit more susceptible. Again, like I'm not, I'm not, I'm not generally a massive fan of genetic screening and in, in terms of like saying that, oh, we should all go and do this and see how that, you know, impacts our health. Like, I don't think we're, we're there yet in terms of doing that stuff. And I think it can have potentially like nocebo-like effects. For example, if you're told that you've got a gene that is associated with a, a certain, you know, adverse outcome, then you can be potentially more likely to actually have that outcome and, and negative effects to your health in general. Um, whether that be through, you know, anxiety about your health um, or some other mechanism for example if you're told that you are not you don't have the the genes let's say you don't have the ACTN3 variation in, f in favor of like strength outcomes like if you don't if you're not if you're not gifted to be a strength athlete then you might say oh you know what resistance training not for me you know for, for me and you like that's probably unlikely but some people do have those those kind of responses you know when so, there are there's a lot of research on that in that when some people are told that they have or that they're they're less likely to be full in response to a meal that's one study um that that is sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy or a nocebo like effect um similar things we see like in, in endurance studies you know you tell people that they have you know poor um gene they have poor genetics for endurance um, and that essentially fulfills itself to some degree because obviously if you think you're not going to be good at something and that you know like oh i'm just not built for this i'm not going to be able to endure you've got that in your mind and that then obviously can affect your performance and we've written about that stuff especially as it relates to pain quite a bit um if you read the manual therapy critical analysis articles on our site or you read the the pain and placebo effects shorter article in the free article section the miss or the the misc content section you'll find those as well so yeah basically what i'm saying is that there's a subset of the population that may be more susceptible to high blood pressure in response to caffeine i happen to have some of the variants that may be you know less favorable for someone looking to lower their blood pressure and that i might be more likely to have to have high blood, high blood pressure for a couple of reasons related to those SNPs um, because I did my 23 in me years ago and basically I've had that report just there all the time so you know you can look, I can look at it sometimes. I don't necessarily recommend that people go and do that because I don't think it leads to like I don't think it leads to any like better outcomes for you as an individual in that like regardless of whether or not I had that report like it, it doesn't matter because like essentially what I was what I was basing my decisions on was the fact that right a subset of the population do have high blood pressure in response to caffeine or, or coffee or you know high caffeine intakes so maybe I might want to consider that as something that I test on myself to see how that affects my health and then I see the outcome so it doesn't matter like whether or not I had the SNPs um, that, that that people were discussing in the research or, or or whatever like it doesn't matter what's going on in the like underlying machinery if you're able to 
change a behavior that leads to a positive outcome. Like if you wanted to lose weight, you wouldn't ask yourself like, oh, I wonder if I have like the, the FTO gene uh, variant. I think that's what it's called. It's, um, it's generally like the, the obesity gene. I think that's the one, I'm not sure. But anyway, I think that's it. Um, point being, like you wouldn't see if you had that first before you try and lose weight. You know, same when it comes to going to the gym to build muscle, you're not like, oh, I gotta figure out what my ACTN3 variation is first, you know. No one worries um, about that stuff. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that's why I, I don't really advise that. That's not to advise my clients to go and get, and it's not something that I use to make personal decisions. It's more so just in this case, like a reinforcing point that, oh yeah, like that might be one of the reasons, but regardless, let's try this, see how it affects your blood pressure. Anyway, to get to the point, to get to the point, it has been positive thus far. You know, since I have reduced my caffeine intake and started not drinking coffee over the last two weeks, um, I have actually seen a lowering of my of my blood pressure, which is which is cool, you know, because it's obviously like, oh yeah, well, that n equals one trial seems to be paying off, um, because there's nothing else that has meaningfully changed in terms of like my lifestyle over, over the last couple of weeks. So basically, I'll continue to monitor that over time, and if there are any other, you know, changes in the wrong direction, then that is something I can I would consider consider managing. Like for example, if I introduce like loads of caffeine and suddenly my blood pressure goes up, it's like, oh well, we might want to. Um, we might want to rein that in a bit, but to get to like a really important point as it relates to this discussion, when you are listening to people like me and we're talk and I'm talking about measuring my blood pressure and ruling out different things, like I I always advise that you like if you're dealing with particular health complaints, you should go to a doctor. Okay, you should go to your GP or whatever and get a like a proper assessment and a doctor's opinion. Okay. In this case, you know, like I would be well, relatively well informed on the different risk factors for me having high blood pressure. And I'd be relatively well, well informed on how to elicit the, the behavior change that is required for me to change any of those behaviors. So through both, you know, through, no, through knowledge and education to some degree, but also through experience of changing my health behaviors over time, I'm fairly in tune with that stuff. But I don't recommend that the that the average person, you know, that without any kind of health education or anything, that they go and do that. Okay, so I I, I want to make that disclaimer because very often we watch people online and we see what they're doing in terms of self experimentation, and we think that we should just go and do that. When in fact, you know, you could be you could be looking at something else that is explaining a certain a certain symptom or a certain presentation. Um, so yeah, you know, if I went to the doctor and I saw, or if I, if I was measuring my blood pressure and I saw that it was consistently, like let's say 160 over 100, as opposed to like being like more modestly increased, then I'd be thinking, okay, you know what? I should probably, I should go to my doctor and I will, you know, consider um, whatever avenues they wanna take. You know, it could be the case that there's some underlying health condition that's more serious, that's leading to an adverse outcome. Like it's not very likely, but it could be the case, or it could be the case that medication actually is something that could benefit you. So these are the types of things that you have to consider, and it's not as simple as just being like, oh, I'm in control of my health, and I'm never gonna go to the doctor, okay? Because uh, I actually did, I actually did go to the doctor, because I had a checkup, and when I was in the office, you know, my blood pressure was, was slightly high. To be fair, I was just after having a coffee, and going to the gym, and coming from the gym and stuff, so I was like, I was like, uh, you know, look, uh, I'm not sure how, how accurate this reading is today, especially when you're just taking one reading in the doctor's office, but I do have a cough at home, so I'll kind of, I'll check it a few times, um, as I always do, and just, just see how it is. And if, if my blood pressure was not lowering and it was remaining high and, or it was increasing and not responding to any lifestyle interventions, then that might be the point at which I consider, you know, going back to my doctor and, and getting an opinion and getting their advice. What do they think might be useful for me um, or whatever? And that's especially important for people who do not have any um, health education or knowledge or experience with changing their health behaviors etc. So that's just a worthwhile message that you probably won't get online very often because because like self-experimentation and kind of like, you know, not like not relying on drugs, you know, kind of being anti-medical establishment, it's pretty popular especially in our in our industry in the fitness industry. So I do not want to be someone who propagates that like I do not want to promote that that is not my perspective on health. Um you should consult with your doctor when you are having health complaints. So there you go. That's my, that's my discussion for this morning. Let's get into the week of training. Hopefully you guys got some, some value from that. Um, again, it wasn't advice. 
And that's why I'm so careful not to say that, you know, all right, you need to go and get a genetic screen and you need to assess your blood pressure all the time. Like, that's not what I'm saying. You know, if most of you at a healthy weight, you're exercising, you're eating well, you probably have no issues with your blood pressure. It's relatively unlikely. Um, but yeah, that's my story. There you go. Let's get into some training and let's, let's show you what an overall week of training looks like for me. Alrighty folks, out for a nice light run this evening, running at roughly six minutes per kilometer pace for 15 kilometers, or at least that's the plan. Did some faster running yesterday, um, around the kind of 410 to 420 pace, um, inclusive of some additional hill sprints. So, so yeah, that's the, the conditioning work. Today is longer distance, lower intensity, um, and obviously I had two hours of jiu-jitsu this morning which is also you know pretty intense conditioning work so so yeah that's that I'm gonna go on my run and I might show you some clips along the way three kilometers down currently in the woods running some trails very beautiful area for a run check on with you soon that's six kilometers just at the top of the hill on Mill Road so down the hill much easier work. It is 10 kilometers complete. I know I said at the start I might do 15 but it's actually almost bedtime and <laughs> I didn't realize how late I set off my run so it's almost 10 now because I set off for my run just before um, 9 o'clock I think I need to check the time <laughs> but it's close enough to 10 and and yeah that's that's that run completed and you know relatively comfortable run overall that's one of the things about, you know, getting into doing a bit of running. The mistake that most people make is that they're, they just take off and just go as fast as they can, which is not what you want. Just like the gym, you know, when we talk about resistance training, we often talk about leaving a couple of reps in the tank, especially when you're learning a new exercise um, and that you don't have to constantly go to failure. And that's kind of the same when it comes to running. You don't want to just go out and go hell for leather every time and try and beat your personal best. Instead, you should be focusing on building your fitness, building your aerobic capacity, um, as opposed to just trying to, you know, win a race every time, because that's not your goal. It's training, not testing. So whether it's strength or your cardiovascular, cardiorespiratory fitness, your goal is to build, not necessarily to test. You know, as you can see, I finished that 10 kilometer run just like, what, three minutes ago? And I'm able to hold a conversation, very in control of my breath, because I was staying in and around, you know, 150 beats per minute, which is about, you know, just around 70%, let's say, 70 to 75% of maximal heart rate. So that's, you know, a relatively decent zone to be in for a kind of a long, cozy run like that so you know if I was trying to beat my best 10 kilometer time then I'd be I'd be working a lot harder and towards the end you'd see me hitting you know 160 170 180 beats per minute relatively consistently and I'd be working pretty hard and would be very out of breath and when I finish I'd be damn glad that I finished you know so so there you go that is that is this evening's run what is up guys we are back with the voiceover these are some clips from an upper body session earlier in the week. This is just me warming up, doing some light chin-ups, and then you'll see me doing kind of some, you know, retraction and depression of the scapula um, on both sides, scapula on the shoulder. Uh, for now, just a couple of chin-ups, nice, easy stuff. And then I think I get back onto the bar, doing a little bit of work kind of right and left, working on that kind of scapula or shoulder control. So you'll see I've got a kind of a wide grip here, hanging, and then just pulling that shoulder down and back on one side. Like there isn't a particular reason that I do this, it's just a combination of movements that I happen to be doing on this day prior to my work sets. My, my warm-ups generally aren't too specific and that's absolutely fine, you know. So here we go, we're doing some weighted chin-ups. I've got my belt, that's a Chiba belt, I believe it's called. Got that from HP Nutrition, same as the t-shirt. Um, so yeah, we're doing some weighted chin-ups, which is an exercise I've really been enjoying lately. I used to despise chin-ups, but really it was just because I'm, 
I wasn't very good at them. Whereas now I'm getting, you know, reasonably okay at them. And I'm going to keep working at them until, you know, I, I feel comfortable like doing like 40 kilos for like sets of five to 10. Cause I think it's a very, it's a very good level of strength to get to. And I would like to be able to do like 50% body weight chin ups for like sets of five plus. So, so yeah, here we have 15 kilos added and I'm doing five repetitions, pausing at the top and at the bottom. Okay, so at the start of my workouts, I like to have some sort of movement like this where it's more, more externally focused, we'll say, in that I'm not trying to do this exercise with the aim of like feeling my lats working as hard as possible or anything, anything like that. Rather, there's particular constraints at the top and the bottom of the movement, and I'm focused on that kind of external goal of getting chin over the bar, down to a dead hang, and that they're my standards for the exercise. And that's just that's the way I like to start my workouts. And then I'll move on to some exercises that are a little bit more internally focused. So here I'm choosing an exercise variation with loose handles um, that tends to allow me to really work my lats um, quite hard. Obviously, it's not just my lats here. It's obviously like your teres major, your posterior deltoids, all the other muscles that are working as well. So it's not just a lat exercise. But but yeah, this is a more internally focused exercise. As I said, you know, I've got that kind of freedom at the hand, which can be really nice for any sort of pull down variation that you do. Um, and I've also got that grip width where it's roughly shoulder width. And we've kind of got that straight line of movement down on either side which can be really nice as well if you're trying to train the lats again still coming to a dead stop at either end of the rep nice and controlled not worry too much about you know maximizing the number of reps that i get rather focusing on the generating that internal tension within the muscles um, which isn't just a case of like just squeezing like you do have to have an appropriate exercise and an appropriate load as well uh, but anyway then we're on to my favorite shoulder exercise the best shoulder exercise, <laughs> or at least for the for the quote unquote middle delts, um, those fibers more so on the side of the shoulder uh, will be hit more during this exercise. So this is a cable lateral raise with a cuff. The big difference here between a cable lateral raise and a dumbbell lateral raise is that the resistance is challenging throughout the range of motion. A lateral raise with a dumbbell is only challenging at the top. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's a fine exercise variation. That's totally fine if that's all you've got access to, but if you've got access to something like this, it's a, a very good option to include in your programming. If you want to, to build bigger shoulders, or if you happen to have pain during exercises, such as the dumbbell lateral raise, because essentially what happens here is that there's a greater challenge towards kind of the bottom and the middle, but as we get to the top, that challenge gets easier, okay? So the resistance actually reduces because essentially what's happening is as I move my arms up to the top, that cable is coming closer to the line of my upper arm and the moment the arm to the shoulder is reduced. That means there's less of a challenge on the shoulder muscles at the top. So if you did have pain that was quite specific to that top range of motion, then this can be a nice variation to help you to train your shoulder muscles without having to be limited by pain. Um, as I say, you know, pain you may, train you must, okay? There's always a way around um, the pain that you experience and you can always continue to do at least some form of training. So here, I'm doing some tricep work. This was mainly to record it for, for our website um, as a, a tutorial video. But this, this second cable that you'll see, um, that's essentially a way of providing restraint, okay? So for example, if you were doing a a dumbbell preacher curl you know you've got that support at the back of the arm that really helps you to maximize the output of the biceps it's a similar story here with the triceps in that when we add that second line of force that restraint that support what that allows us to do is create that stability at the upper arm without having to use you know the muscles of the shoulder to try and hold it in place and if you try this like it's like it's only a, it's, it's only it's not like it's going to max like rapidly change your hypertrophy outcomes or anything but if you try this you will definitely notice the difference and notice that your tricep is working incredibly hard throughout every portion of the range of motion so you know if you're someone that finds your shoulders are the limiting factor during this exercise which isn't uncommon um that could potentially be a nice modification then i was doing some runs on the treadmill on this day i believe i did yeah this is 500 meters at 20 kilometers per hour so that is 500 meters in 90 seconds okay so 90 seconds to do 500 meters so you know relatively decent pace i find it really weird doing doing any sort of sprint on the treadmill because it's just weird that you're not moving forward i prefer 
uh, running outdoors, especially when I'm doing any sprint variations. So, so yeah, it is what it is. It's 90 seconds long. It's, it's pretty tough. You know, I really like these kind of runs between the 300 to 500 meter, um, distance because there's just that space between like, oh yeah, where you're kind of good at endurance, but, and then you're kind of good at doing sprints, but then th this work in between where, you know, you're working like really, really hard, like pushing yourself quite hard. You're, you're working kind of more anaerobically, let's say, um, it's, it's, it's hard stuff. You know, you're going to feel, you're going to feel your muscles burning quite hard you're going to feel the burn <laughs> and you're going to be damn glad that you that you are finishing when it comes to that because it is that combination of like high force you know high force production and that like it's 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 similar to a sprint in that sense but you've also got that sense of being ridiculously out of breath your muscles are burning and it's it's quite the challenge so so yeah i do i do like do like those variations um next up we've got some like like a five-year-old boxing i only included this kind of like partially to to ridicule myself and partially for for transparency's sake i don't i don't do this often but on this day i happen to do a little bit of boxing i really don't like punching this bag because i'm essentially punching right at the top which is you know where the padding is like reduced because i'm i'm much taller than these bags so stop gotta stop making these bags for manliths i can't even imagine how how paddy feels because he can actually box you know mm. unlike me uh, but yeah just throwing some punches for the crack uh, no no defined training outcome or adaptation that i'm looking for here other than just you know five to ten minutes of fun at the end of my workout um, same here with the the aqua bag or water bag or whatever it's called and um, this was actually burst you can see the water flying out i didn't realize that but that's why i stopped uh, after this and uh and yeah, that's that. Let's get back to something I'm at least moderately good at. So here we have sumo deadlifts. Um, nice control on the way down, pausing at the bottom. 145 kilos for three sets of eight on this day. Um, as you might be aware, if you follow me on the Instagram, I have been kind of suffering from an adductor, or some, some adductor related groin pain over the last few months. So to be getting back to doing some decent uh, sumo deadlifts is a, is a good feeling. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can always train, you know, in this case, the modifications that I make to ensure the pain isn't so much of a limiting a limiting factor is, you know, controlling the direct, the change of direction, pausing a little bit at the bottom and, and yeah, just, just staying in control, not working with maximal weights, keeping three to four reps in reserve on these sets and working with a weight that is, you know, sub maximal for me, that it's not close to the amount that I, the maximum amount that I could lift. So, you know, my max, my max sumo deadlift ever was, I think it was 230 or 235. I'm not actually sure, but, but I did 200 by five earlier this year and 100, 180 by, 10, I don't know, what did I do? 190 by 10 or 190 by eight? I can't even remember. It's not too much of a big deal. But anyway, then we're into some jujitsu. This kind of speaks for itself. I won't voice over too much, but it's just to give you guys who don't know what jujitsu is a bit of a feeler. So as you can see, I'm on the right here with Magic. Magic is a blue belt, so he's he's much better than me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm not just going to include things where I look good. <laughs> but we, I got this, uh, what do you call it, the Americana here. So managed to get that one on him. But you know, he's he's a he's far better at jujitsu um, than me. So I made sure to include him tapping me out right after this. I believe. Um, so yeah, generally what you do is like you do like a five minute roll, which then involves like, you know, you stick in with one person and when someone taps, you oh, wait, here's me tapping. Yeah, there you go. He got me there. Um, but yeah, when someone taps, then you basically just restart and keep going for the five minutes. Uh, and then this is Liam. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're getting after it. It's, it's good because me and Liam are kind of like a, at a similar level, like both beginners. So we always have, you know, good fun when we're, when we're rolling, but, but yeah, no one, no one tapped anyone out here. Um, he had me in a pretty good position here, but I managed to be a little bit of a snake and get out of that. Um, and then he does a similar thing later on to me when I thought I had that arm bar. Well, yeah, that's, that's jujitsu. For those of you who don't know what it is, this is just a brief insight. It is, you know, incredibly fun, incredibly challenging training as well. Like this is, as you can imagine, when you're trying to fight someone, you're in, you're in like high pressure situations. You've got a lot of pressure on you, and you're also 
working quite hard in terms of strength and you're doing that consistently. Um, it does add up in terms of being quite challenging from, from a conditioning perspective. So, so yeah, that, that's that. I'll let you guys watch the rest of, of this clip. Enjoy it. And I will then see you guys in the next video where I will probably be in Cork and will have my camera back so the quality will be a little bit better on all of these videos. So thanks for watching and of course like, subscribe and all that stuff.